Assalamu alaikum and good morning, everyone. We are going to continue with topic 16, hydroxy compounds. Just to remind you again, at the end of this lesson, you will fill in a post-test questions based on what we are going to cover today. There will be a link to the Microsoft form. Please fill in the form and that will be your attendance for the day, okay? Right, last lesson, we looked at the different reactions that can be used to produce alcohol. And there are plenty of them actually, okay? So you can produce an alcohol from alkenes uh, using steam and a catalyst. You can form diols also from alkenes. And this reaction is called the mild oxidation. You can transform your halogenoalkanes into alcohol using a reaction called nucleophilic substitution. And then when you reduce your aldehydes and ketones, you can get primary and secondary alcohol respectively. Uh, reducing carboxylic acid will also give you primary alcohol, okay? And lastly, when you hydrolyze esters, you will get two products, which is alcohol and carboxylic acid, okay? So for today, we're going to look at the chemical properties, which is the reactions that alcohol can go through okay so the first one is combustion a combustion reaction is a common reaction for your hydrocarbons and it is the reaction that makes your hydrocarbons or your organic compounds act as a fuel the reason for this is because when you burn your alcohol for example you will produce carbon dioxide and water if they undergo complete combustion. But the most important thing is during this burning or combustion process, it is an exothermic reaction where you release, okay? So that negative sign indicates the exothermic uh, reaction and you release 1,371 kilojoules per one mole of ethanol being burnt or being combusted. So because of this, it makes a great fuel, okay? So ethanol is a common fuel used in Brazil and it is referred to as biofuel. So biofuel is anything that comes from living matter. Uh, so the reason why it's called a biofuel is because ethanol can be produced by the fermentation of sugar canes. Okay, so um, that is basically uh, the, the info that you need um, from the combustion of alcohol. So different types of alcohols can be combusted to give you carbon dioxide and water as long as they are uh, given enough oxygen, okay, in excess oxygen. Right, the next reaction, okay, so that is just the general equation for the combustion of any alcohol, whether it's carbon-2, carbon-4, carbon-100, carbon-1000, um, it will give you carbon dioxide and water. The next reaction that we're going to look at is uh, the reaction of alcohol with sodium metal. Okay, so the, the state symbol is solid there. Uh, and later on, under the same section, we're going to explain the acidity of alcohols compared with water. So this statement is already giving you a hint that alcohol has some kind of acidity. So if you just imagine acid reacting with a metal, a sodium metal, you would expect the products to be salt and hydrogen gas, okay? As a matter of fact, alcohol is actually an acid, a very weak acid, okay? So we'll talk about that later on. So that's why you would imagine the reaction of alcohol with sodium metal 
to be similar to of that an acid with sodium metal. Okay, so when an alcohol reacts with a reactive metal such as sodium, the oxygen hydrogen bond in the hydroxy group breaks. So what it means by this is, so for example, I have an ethanol. Okay, so the oxygen hydrogen bond will break. All right. Um, what are the products being produced? We call the salt produced when alcohols react with metal and alkoxide. The, this alkoxide is a basic uh, salt, a basic compound. Okay. Um, the name alkoxide is basically your alcohol that have that has lost its H plus. Okay. For example, here we have ethanol. But once I lost my H plus because an acid loses its H plus, remember, then I have what is called an ethoxide from ethanol to ethoxide. So from alcohol to alkoxide. So alkoxide is the general name for the salt of your alcohol. Okay. And of course, the other product. Uh, that you get that you can observe is the formation of hydrogen gas, just like um, how you would have, say, hydrochloric acid reacting with a sodium metal, you get a salt and also hydrogen gas. Okay, so that means um, there is something that you can observe, right? The observation would be, of course, first the formation of gas. You cannot just assume that it's hydrogen, hydrogen gas first unless you carry out the test. Okay, so that's one observation. Other observations that you can see is that the sodium sinks. The sodium will dissolve eventually at the end of the reaction. You will no longer see the sodium because all of it has dissolved, uh, reacted with ethanol for example, and bubbles of hydrogen gas evolve. So there are three observations that you can see when ethanol reacts with sodium metal, okay? So the fact that you can observe, you can see something from the reaction, this, is, this makes it useful as a test, okay? So this reaction, adding sodium to an unknown, alcohol, if you want to confirm that it is an alcohol, you just chuck in sodium metal and then you see, can you observe this? Okay, so that's one of the tests, but it's not the confirmatory test. Okay, that means it can help you to, to identify, but it is not the only test that you can use just because you see uh, hydrogen gas being produced, you say, ah, confirm, this contains alcohol. No, because later on, you will see that another functional group, hint, is an acid as well, will react with sodium the same way alcohols uh, react with sodium, right? So this is used as a test for um, OH group. Oh, okay. So it says here that uh, the same observation will be um, uh, observed when you throw in sodium into an alcohol or a carboxylic acid, okay? So what happens if we just look at, okay, so if we just look at the equation, we have an ethanol reacting with sodium, as you would expect. If you imagine uh, if it, your ethanol is an acid, not imagine because it is an acid, right? So your ethanol is an acid reacting with a methyl, metal sodium. You will get a salt called a sodium ethoxide and a hydrogen gas. Okay, so we'll look at the structure on the next slide. You can pause this video before moving on to the next one, if you want to copy down the observation. Okay, so in this reaction, alcohol acts as an acid. And as we all know, acids lose its H plus 
assets give away its H plus. Now, another name for H plus is protons. I will not explain it to you now because you haven't covered assets and bases yet, which is in the earlier topics. Okay, but what I want to show you is that when you have an ethanol, the OH bond will break. Okay, so that bond will break. And then you react it with sodium. The salt you form will be derived from the ethanol. It is called the ethoxide. Okay. And the other product you will get will be hydrogen gas. Okay. Since they're all in one mole, I'm just going to make this half. Now, you can see that I have lost my hydrogen to become H+, which is not shown in this equation, right? So when I have lost H+, I am left with an anion, which is called an ethoxide. Okay, now how can I balance or cancel out that negative charge? Sodium, remember my sodium metal? My sodium metal will become sodium ion Na+. So there we have Na+, and C2H5O- and ethoxide. We call it a sodium ethoxide. And this is applicable for other alcohols as well, right? So this reaction, is similar to sodium with water, but uh, sodium with water is more vigorous, okay? Uh, sodium with alcohol, ethanol, is slower since the OH bond is stronger in the ethanol compared to the OH bond in water. Therefore, it's easier to lose this um, proton, H+. Plus, okay? So we'll talk about the strength of the um, acids in terms of water and alcohols, okay? So if you want to pause here to copy the things down, you can. Okay, moving on to the next one, acidity of alcohols versus water, okay? Um, sorry, I need to add something here, which I forgot to do. The larger the hydrocarbon chain, in the alcohol, the less vigorous the reaction becomes, okay? Uh, so you can imagine in an alcohol, it is only the OH part of the molecule will get involved in a reaction with sodium. So the hydrocarbon tails is actually um, redundant, okay? They don't get involved in the reaction, but the bigger the hydrocarbon tails, uh, the less vigorous the reaction will become. It just means that the hydrocarbon tails will dominate the molecule, okay? Right, uh, next one, acidity of alcohols versus water. Now, since we haven't covered acids and bases yet, this slide, this part of the notes, will maybe sound a little bit confusing for you, okay? Um, so I'm just going to explain um, quickly and then the explanation, okay? 
And later on, at the end of my explanation, you will copy all of this down onto your notes. Okay, right. So for acids, usually we talk about the dissociation or ionization. It means that the acid molecule will be broken down, dissociated or ionized into its ions. That's how we define acids by looking at the species that is released during dissociation or ionization. Okay, so the common acids that you have come across would be, say, HCl. When you dissociate HCl, you get H plus and Cl minus. Okay, but here, alcohols or ethanols can also do the same. They will dissociate, they will break down the OH bond. Okay, they will release H plus. So since acid is a species that can release hydrogen ions in solution, okay, that means it is an acid. Alcohol is an acid. It is a weak acid and it's much weaker acid than water. Now, we don't usually say that water is acidic, correct? But because water can dissociate, water can break down into ions respectively. And the ions is hydroxide ion. The ions are hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions. So you may think, well, there's also hydroxide ion, okay? But because there is H plus in this dissociation process, we can call water as an acid, but a very weak one, okay? So what happens is that ethanol dissociate into ethoxide ion and hydrogen ion, or what we call the protons, okay? Okay, so um, equilibrium is also a concept or an idea that is not, well, you have looked at equilibrium, but not for AS, okay? So because um, alcohols and water are weak acids, we say that the position of the equilibrium lies onto the left, okay? They favor the backwards reaction. They don't, not so much the forward reaction, okay? The reversible arrow is an indication that it is a weak acid. Right? The fact that the position of the equilibrium for the dissociations of alcohol and water to the left means that you do not have a lot of hydrogen ion because most of your hydrogen ions will be combined with the anion to give you either ethanol or your water. Okay, so for alcohol, the concentration of the hydrogen ion is low. The concentration of hydrogen ion in water is also low. However, it's a little bit higher than your alcohol. So the acidity is measured based on how much hydrogen ion is present in the solution, okay? So we say that the concentration of hydrogen ion in alcohols are generally lower than the concentration of hydrogen ion in water, okay? So that explains why alcohol is a weaker acid than water. The reason for the low concentration of hydrogen has something to do with the stability of the anion, okay? It depends on how well this anion attracts the hydrogen plus. Okay, how well the hydroxide ion attracts to the hydrogen plus. Now, if the attraction is stronger, that means the anion will combine with the hydrogen ion to form the ethanol. Okay, or hydroxide ion has a strong attraction with the hydrogen to form water. Okay, so... <clears throat> The explanation for the alkoxide ion, the ethoxide ion, is that in this case, the ethoxide ion is 
attracting the hydrogen ions. Okay. Now, why? If you imagine this oxygen, it has a negative charge already, right? For an alkoxide ion, or a specific name is an ethoxide, ethoxide ion. This oxygen is attached to an alkyl group, an ethyl group. Um, alkyl groups in general has this tendency of pushing electron density. So it pushes electron density towards the already negative oxygen. Okay. In terms of stability, if you think about it, a person is already negative, you're adding more negativity to it, it is not stable, it will become unstable. Okay, right, that's in terms of stability. Now I want to talk about how well or how attractive this charge is. So oxygen is already negative, alkyl group is now donating negativity to the oxygen. So the oxygen now have a high charge density. Okay, so there's a high electron density around the oxygen atom. So this one becomes really negative and therefore it will attract the H plus. What's wrong with that? That means your H plus in the solution will become low. The concentration of your hydrogen in the solution will become low because these two ions combine to form ethanol. So that's what the explanation is saying here. Why are there, why are why is the concentration of hydrogen plus ion in alcohol lower than in water. This is because the alkoxide ion have, has an alkyl electron donating group that push the electron density on the negative charge of the oxygen. So that means the alkoxide ion is more likely to accept H plus ion to form the alcohol. We are favoring the reverse reaction. Okay, so that explains why you have less hydrogen ions for alcohol compared to hydrogen ions in water. Okay, so if you want to pause, you can do now and copy down this information. Just at the bottom, of page three, okay? So I know it is a new concept for you. I think it will probably not make sense to, to any of you, um, but just copy this down first. And then hopefully later on when we visit acetan basis, and then you come to revisit this topic, it will make more sense, okay? <clears throat> All right, so that sums up the reaction of alcohol with sodium metals, okay? So in general, alcohol will react with sodium metal to form a sodium alkoxide and hydrogen gas. Next learning objective that we're going to look at is the substitution of halogenoalkanes um, Oh, sorry, substitution of alcohol to produce halogenoalkanes by either using um, HX. So HX is your hydrogen halides, whether it's HCl, HBr, or HI. Um, you can use PCl3 and heat, or with PCl5, or with SOCL2, S-O-C-L2. So there's actually... Um, a few reactions that you can use, but I'll tell you later which one is uh, the best, okay? Right, so the substitution of um, alcohols to give halogenoalkanes, unlike the reaction of alcohol with sodium, this time it is the whole OH group that is being replaced by a halogen atom, okay? In the sodium, 
uh, in the reaction of sodium and alcohol just now, it is the OH bond. Only the hydrogen ion is lost from the alcohol. Okay, so looking at the first reagent that you can use. Okay, so this is reagent A or part A with hydrogen halide. So you can use hydrogen halide, reflux it with an alcohol, and then you will replace the OH group, the whole of OH group, not just the H plus, be careful, okay, with the bromine atom. Okay, so what happens is that substitution will happen here. Now, if you notice that it says alcohol is refluxed with sodium NaX and concentrated sulfuric acid to make HX in situ. In situ means on site. In the, in the reaction vessel. So hydrogen halides does not come in a bottle that uh, a supplier can send to us, okay? We have to produce the hydrogen halide on the spot. And to produce hydrogen halide, you will need sodium halides, depending on what you want to produce. That's your X. If you want to produce hydrogen bromide, this becomes a sodium bromide. If you want to produce hydrogen chloride, this becomes sodium chloride. Okay, so you take a sodium halides, react it with a concentrated sulfuric acid. And then what happens is that the sodium chloride will first react with the sulfuric acid and then you form a sodium hydrogen sulfate and the hydrogen halide. So this is the hydrogen halide that we are interested in. From here, then the hydrogen halide will react with your alcohol. Okay, so inside means you are producing the hydrogen halides on the spot. It did not, it does not come from a, a supplier's bottle. Okay. Uh, during the substitution reaction, thankfully you don't have to learn the mechanism. All you have to do is that the hydroxide ion, OH, uh, sorry, the hydroxide uh, hydroxy group will be replaced by your halide, uh, halogens. Okay. Um, Hydrogen halides can be in gas form or in aqueous form um, to form a halogenoalkane. So depending on what you use, if you use HPR, then you will form a bromoethane. The other product would be water. Okay. Um, the conditions, you need to carry this out in a reflux. Okay. What if you don't want to make the hydrogen halides on the spot? You can use a concentrated hydrogen bromide only if it is an aqueous form. If it's a gas form of hydrogen bromide or a gas form of hydrogen chloride, you cannot keep this in a bottle. You have to make it on the spot. Okay, so this, um, right, so sodium halides, and sulfuric acid is to make your HX. Okay, next is by using phosphorus chloride PCL5 or PCL3. Okay, now with PCL3, you need heat. So I forgot to um, add this onto your notes because I just noticed just now in your in the learning objective, it mentions that PCL3 and heat, okay? So you can just add that on. Um, here, okay? So you can use PCL3, but plus heat. If you use PCL5, or PI3 slash PBR3, okay? This is called a 
phosphorus pentachloride, PCL5. PI3 is called a phosphorus triiodide. PBR3 is called a phosphorus tribromide. Okay. If you use any of this reagent, of course, you just choose one. It depends on what halogenal alkenes you want to produce. You don't need a catalyst. You don't need to add acid or whatsoever. You just need to do this in room temperature. No reflux. So you can see that the second reaction using phosphorus halides is much easier than using hydrogen halides. Okay, The product will still be the same. You are replacing the hydroxy group with the halogen, depending on the phosphorus halide that you are using. If you want to form chloroalkanes, you use PCL5. If you want to form bromoalkane, you use PBR3. If you want iodoalkane, you use PI3. Okay, And everything else, you just change. Change this from chlorine to bromine or to iodine. Okay. Um, okay, so then in the product, you get a chloroethane. Other products, you will get POCl3 and HCl gas in the gas form, not in the aqueous form. Okay, so hydrogen chloride in gas form will appear as white steamy fumes. So again, if you see an observation, it is a great test. We can use it as a test. So hydrogen chloride will be observed as steamy fumes. And this can be used as a test for your hydroxy group again. Okay. So PCL5, you throw in, don't need a special setup, don't need uh, reflux, don't need catalyst and whatsoever. And if you see white fumes, that means it contains OH bond, okay? The rest of the molecule stays unchanged. Please take note, your C2H5 stays unchanged. Okay, nice. You get POCl3 liquid and you get HCl gas. Okay, the last one is the easiest one, sulfur dichloride, okay? Why? We thought that the second part is already the easiest, right? Okay, now, um, oh, okay. So this is if you want to use uh, bromoalkanes or iodoalkanes. Okay, sorry, I didn't see this part. So if you use phosphorus iodide or phosphorus bromide, you will get a phosphoric acid. H3PO3, okay? Um, and that is in liquid form, right? And then, of course, you, for, uh, you produce iodoethane. Okay, um, so PI3 and PBR3 is not something that you can get from a supplier's bottle. You need to produce it in situ. Again, you need to produce it on site. Using... Uh, phosphorus and iodine to produce PI3 or you use phosphorus and bromine to produce PBR3. Now, the products are both liquids. This, apply for, this applies for PCL5 as well. The products, two products are liquids. The other one is gas. Gas is fine. You just let it evaporate. Okay. Here you have two liquids and we are only interested in our iodoalkanes, right? So how do we separate them? Since they are both liquids, we need to do a fractional distillation, okay? Usually fractional distillations, fr fr sorry, fractional distillation is used to separate two liquids that have different boiling point. If they have the same boiling point, then that's, that's useless, okay? <clears throat> right. Um, next is the last one, part C, okay? So I forgot to change this to part C. With sulfur dichloride oxide, SOCl2. Now, this is the best reaction 
if you want to transform your alcohol into a halogenol alkenes. Okay, you just use SOCl2. Um, so you can either use the liquid SOCl2 or solid SOCl2. We call this a SOCl2. Uh, what happens is that uh, same thing happens. Your hydroxide hydroxy group will be replaced with your halogen. In this case, it's chlorine. So you produce the same product as well, chloroethane, uh, just like the other first two reactions that we looked at. But the best thing about this reaction is that you produce only one liquid product. The other products are gases. And how do we separate liquids from gas? We just let the gases evaporate. So if you let this to evaporate, you get your halogenol alkenes. Okay, so the two byproducts are both gases, therefore they escape from the reaction mixture, leaving the halogenol alkane alone behind. And that is the product that we are interested in because we want to convert our alcohol to halogenol alkanes, right? So in this case, fractional distillation is not needed. Moving on to distillation, this is the setup of a distillation. If you want to carry out um, distillation, so you have your reaction mixture here. Usually it um, is using a round bottom flask. Okay, so my drawing is not appearing. Yeah, it's slow. Okay, so you apply heat here where it says heat, okay? Um, and then you need to make sure that this is airtight. If you don't cover this part of the setup, then it will just evaporate, okay? So this needs to be airtight. Sorry, hold on. Okay, back. Um, so if you don't cover this top part, then it will just evaporate, okay? You have a thermometer. The reason why you have a thermometer here is because when you have your uh, first liquid, the one with, with a lower uh, boiling point, it will diffuse up and then it now it cannot escape. So the only possible path for it is to go through this um, site arm and then to the condenser remember this condenser is cold so now the gas turns into a liquid and then it just flows into the collector right now why do we need a thermometer so that we know the liquid that we are collecting here what is the boiling point okay all right um so this technique is used as a separate uh, a separation technique to to yeah to separate organic products. Um, so you will be collecting the distillate here according to its boiling point. Okay, the bulb of the thermometer should be at the T junction connecting to the condenser to measure the correct boiling point. So you don't want it to be too low or too high. Okay, because you want to to be to read the temperature of the molecules that are passing through this side arm, okay? Right, that's distillation. So now this is the um, summary. I think this would make a good summary as well uh, for the substitution of alcohols um, with either hydrogen halides, phosphorus halides, depending on which one you are using, and SOCL2, S-O-C-L2. So this one is only for um, chloroalkanes, the last one, okay? If you want to produce um, iodoalkane or bromoalkane, then I suggest you to, to go with the first three reactions, okay? So if you want to copy this down, you can pause the slide, uh, pause the video here, but I'm afraid that you would not have enough space on your notes so you can copy it down on a piece of paper and just attach it to your notes. Okay, the last 
reaction that we are going to cover today is the dehydration of alcohol to alkene using a heated catalyst, okay? Either you use aluminium oxide as a catalyst or a concentrated acid as a catalyst. Now, dehydration is a type of elimination reaction. Elimination reaction is a reaction that removes a small molecule. Um, so in this case, dehydration is specific. We are removing water. Okay, so when you remove water from alcohols, it we form alkenes. The first example that we're going to look at is ethanol. Okay, so when you remove, uh, sorry, when you treat ethanol um, heated at hundred about one hundred and seventy degrees Celsius with the present presence of a catalyst, which is your concentrated sulfuric acid, okay, you will lose water from alcohol to form an alkene, okay? So the equation is given to you on your notes, um, but I want you to draw it out and to show how water is being lost, okay? So this works for elimination reaction like we have seen in hal alkenes, when we lose um, hydrogen halides as well from the molecule of alkenes. Here we lose water, okay? So I will always number my carbon and remember the functional group of alcohol is the OH, so I will lose the OH first. Well, it doesn't matter which one you lose first, okay? But you have to lose that OH. So I have lost my OH from the first carbon, which is the one on the very far right here. That's my first carbon. And then I need to lose hydrogen, okay? The hydrogen that I lose will have to be on the adjacent carbon or the neighboring carbon of carbon one. So that means it's carbon two, lah, okay? So that means I will lose H from carbon two and I lose OH from carbon one. So if I draw my product, always number my carbon first so I can see I have lost that hydrogen um, OH group. I have also lost a hydrogen atom from carbon number two. So you see here, these two carbons, they only have three bonds, okay? To make it a complete bond, it forms a double bond, okay? Oh, sorry, this is not an ethanol. This is a propan one all, okay? Sorry. So that's a totally um, different reaction from the example that you have uh, on your notes, okay? But Still, the idea is the same. You lose water from two neighboring carbon atoms or adjacent carbon atoms to form a double bond. And of course, in the product, you get water. Okay. Right. So if you want to pause this, um, just write it anywhere below um, method one. Okay. So the first method is using cat. Um, concentrated acid as a catalyst, heated under reflux or up to 170 degrees Celsius. Sometimes the temperature is not required, okay? Um, you can get an, a dehydration reaction to happen. The second method is uh, using heated aluminium oxide, all right? It's the same... Uh, reaction the only difference is in the procedure okay but in your notes i think i don't know i noticed that the example was placed somewhere okay so i want to look at the dehydration of butan to all first i think it's somewhere on your notes uh, example uh, dehydration of butan to all okay so i will start numbering my carbon atoms, okay, always taking the functional group to have the lowest carbon atom. So I start my counting from this end, okay, carbon one, two, three, four. Right, again, I, so you can already tell that there will be two products, okay. Um, 
I will lose my OH from carbon number two. That means I have a choice to either lose from carbon one or carbon three, right? And usually you will get a mixture of both products. One, a major product and the other one, a minor product, okay? So first I'm going to lose the hydrogen from carbon one and the hydrox a hydroxy group from carbon two to give me this. If you can already see it, if you can spot it, you remove from one and two. Obviously your double bond will have to be on one and two as well. Okay, so that's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, and carbon four. So my double bond will be on carbon one and two. Oh, sorry. Carbon one and two, which is here. Okay. The other option is to lose OH from carbon two. Well, that you don't have a choice. You have to lose that that hydroxy group from carbon two and then lose the hydrogen from carbon three, in which case you will get one, two, three, four, okay? Um, again, you lose from carbon two and three, your double bond will be on carbon two and three as well. Okay, and that's that, right? So, Butantuol can form both alkenes, although more butuene would be formed. So the more the the major product would be butuene, and the stop one is but one in, and this is your major product. This is your minor product. Okay, so OH group and hydrogen atoms are lost from adjacent or neighboring carbon atoms. Okay, so you can pause here to copy down Um, okay, moving on to the second method of dehydration of alcohols. This time you are using a heated aluminium oxide. So this is the um, setup. Sometimes you use pumice, that is just some uh, catalyst as well, okay? Um, you would want to treat the gaseous alcohol so that it moves through the aluminium oxide or the pumice, and then it gets dehydrated or um, elimination reaction happens, okay? So you start from um, ethanol, that means the ethanol will be vaporized, okay? It moves through. This is where it happens, where it is being converted to an ethene. And ethene is a gas, so you can collect the gas uh, over water. Okay, so that's up to you. Um, but I suggest you to remember both method one and method two, because sometimes um, in the question paper, they like to use either one of the method, okay? But the same thing happens you lose OH from one carbon and hydrogen from the adjacent carbon or the neighboring carbon to form an alkene and water as your other product, okay? Right, so that is all for today. Don't forget to uh, click on the link to the Microsoft Forms, answer the questions. It will be related to the ones that we have learned today. Okay. Assalamu alaikum and thank you everyone.